What's up everyone, Pear from Into Fly Fishing and welcome to another tutorial. We just arrived back from the Maldives and Chris and I was having a chat earlier this morning about what we packed and how much of that gear we actually used and what we didn't use. So we thought of doing a video for you on how to pack for a saltwater trip. And from my side, I'm gonna be approaching this thing from a newbie's perspective, because this is my first saltwater fly fishing trip. And if I had gone on this trip on my own without Pierre, I would have been severely underprepared. So I was quite surprised at how much stuff that I needed that I didn't think about before. Great, compliments. Compliments of flowing, really, I really appreciate it. wasn't really a compliment, it was just more <laughs> of an observation. <laughs> I just want to give a big shout out to the guys over at Snowby who made this trip possible. We fished two of their rods and one of their reels throughout the whole trip and it really impressed me so much. First rod that we fished was the brand new Prestige GXS 10 weight rod. It's a brand new rod meant for bigger game fish species. And the other rod that we spent the most time with was the Spectre RMX 8 weight rod. Yeah, I must say that that 10 weight rod that we caught those two big GTs on, like really held up well. Yeah, it didn't do bad at all. Yeah, a lot of the other guys were using 12 weights and flogging those all day and we wanted to give our arms a rest so we started using some 10 weight rods and hooked into some good GTs and yeah, it held up really well. So let's dive into the list of things that you need to pack on a saltwater trip. For this list, I split it into two different areas. So the first is on the water equipment that you need to pack. These are absolutely necessary for a saltwater trip and the other is off the water. So that's sort of after you've gone back to the lodge or your hotel or whatever, what you, what you need around there, which isn't necessary, but it just sort of makes life comfortable. So let's first start with on the water equipment. So first we're looking at the specific rigs that we need to fish. And then from there on, we'll go to the extra paraphernalia that sort of makes it a lot more comfortable and stuff that you need on the water. So our primary pieces of equipment are obviously the rods and the reels, but let's go through the rods first. Now you're not gonna be doing much fishing if you don't have a rod. Exactly, exactly. Then you're gonna catch just as much as I did in the last two days, which is zero, by the way. Anyway, so the first rod we have here is an eight weight. We chose to go with eight weights, 10 weights, and 12 weights. So for each rod, I'm try, I'll try and have a backup. It's very important to have backups. Things go wrong and you spend a lot of money going on these trips and you don't want a whole trip to be a failure because you only brought one rod with. Yeah, you don't want to run out of rods. And exactly. You, you're in a once in a lifetime destination and you're sitting there on the beach with no rods. So e exactly. I think backups, not only of rods, but of most things is an essential. Yeah, thing. basically all of the equipment that we're going to cover, you have to have some sort of backup or a plan to sort of adapt something to, to work with that rig. So with eight weights, as we mentioned earlier, we use the Snowbee Spectre RMX 8 weight and as a backup I have my trusty old TFO BVK in an 8 weight which is also a great rod and then from that we go to the 10 weights. I only took one 10 weight because I didn't have a spare which was risky but this was the Snowbee Prestige GXS the brand new 10 weight rod which yeah, you just said, phenomenal rod, yeah. Yeah, you just, we, we caught a couple of jeets on it and it really performed really well. And then for the heavier stuff, if you're going to target dry and true valley on a frequent basis on a saltwater trip or top and you know, anything, anything that's really a large predatory species, you need a 12 weight rig, a proper 12 weight rig. So unfortunately my 12 weight that we used on the trip is in for repairs. The cork was shot, the rod is like 12 years old, so I just sent it in for repairs. So that was just the old Sage XR2 and then backup, very important for a 12 weight rig. This is an Echo Badass Glass 12 weight, which is a very reliable sort of 12 weight. Great rod to have as a backup. I must say as well, um, if you've never been on a saltwater trip and you've never thrown a 12 weight, you should train your body to throw a 12 weight because yes. even the most experienced guys there like Marius, who, who do it often, was also by the end of seven days, his body was falling apart. Yes. So my arm after the first day, I, was, I didn't enjoy it at all. Not, <laughs> I didn't even catch a fish. I didn't even catch a GT on the first day, but... Neither of us did. Everybody was just absolutely finished by the yes. evening. Their, their bodies were broken after day one. So do some practicing, 
go to the field, throw the rod, do some yes. gym work, do some bench press, do some yes. bicep curls, yes. tricep curls. Yes. I know you tricep curl, but do it. <laughs> just, just do it. Yeah, just do <laughs> do it. everything you can. Yeah. Um, so that, those are the rods. If you are going on a saltwater trip, and you don't have many rods, or you you are going to buy a brand new set of rods, I would recommend just going for a 12 and a 9. It's not necessary to have all these rods. A 12 and a 9 would cover basically any scenario that you, you'd ever encounter on saltwater flats. Having said that, having a 10 weight and an 8 weight makes it a lot more, makes your abilities or it just opens up a lot more abilities for you as well so we were sort of in the pound seats with that but just i just wanted to bring that up that you you can get away with just a 9 and a 12 and in actual fact i prefer just having a 9 and a 12 because it just makes all your extra gear your reels and your lines so much more easier to manage yeah i think an eight weight also although they they fun on the smaller reef species you don't want to get stuck into a good gt like you did on a little spawning shrimp <laughs> throwing an eight weight it's your chances of bringing it in are, are slim. Luckily, luckily I'm, I'm an experienced angler, so I, I managed to perform luckily, that. Luckily, the fish beats <laughs> itself on a rock. <laughs> well, that's yeah, it. Walked up to it. And just picked it up by the tail. <laughs> anyway, now each rod needs to be paired with a reel. So for your 12 weight, there's no getting past it. You have to have a proper, proper reel with a proper drag and very reliable system. So in this case, if you are going on a once in a lifetime trip, and you are going to catch that once in a lifetime dream fish, don't skimp on your 12 weight reel. So this is a Shilton, and it has about 250 yards of 80 pound backing on it with a scientific anglers floating, like a very heavy head forward, weight forward floating line. I would not recommend going anything like cheap. I know this is like contrary to what many people are saying that you can get by with it but don't take the chance because things go wrong yeah you can probably get away with it 99 percent of the time catching decent sized fish but then you look into that one yes once in a lifetime fish and yes. then if you don't have high quality drags and high quality reels and lines yes it's i mean the fish the gts we were catching were small in comparison to what we were seeing yes, so yes. on the back line. You look into those, those big guys at the back. Uh, There's no way that... I can't uh, even imagine yeah. yes. how you're going to stop that thing. You're, even with a reel like this, um, even with a Mako, it, I mean, you, the odds are stacked up against you in any way. So rather, rather just have the best. Especially the best on a 12 afford, yeah. of, of course, yeah. yes. Um, for the 10 weight, great to have another reel specific for the 10 weight. Um, this is just a wade, um, very cool sort of reel. And then for the eight weight, it's great to have an eight weight specific reel as well. This, the eight weight or your nine weight will be the rig that you fish the most. So just have something that can take a lot of salt water damage. You won't necessarily use the drag that much, um, but it needs to be something that you can drop in the sand, drop in the water and you just can give it a yeah. good rinse and it goes that's it. Yeah, you aren't going to keep these reels dry during this kind of trip. It's exactly. going to be submerged in salt water 99% of the time. Yes, exactly. Almost like my camera gear was, but maybe a little bit less. <laughs> <laughs> On each reel, it's very important to have good backing and a good fly line. And in most of the tropic water environments or um, areas that we are fishing, we use floating fly lines only real exception is if you're dredging deep or fishing to sailfish or wahoo or anything like that from the back of a of a of a sport fish or something like that so a good floating line is essential on each of your of your reels and then especially on your 12 weight but it's good to have a nine weight as well have a couple of spare fly lines and a spool of spare backing this is really essential because as you just said those fish are super strong and if you look into one of those big fish, you really not in control. So if they spool you or cut you on a, like we call it a bommy or a coral head or something, then your fly line will snap. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's important to have a couple of spare lines, which is super important. 
If you do manage to break your loop connection on your fly line or you have to replace a fly line and it doesn't have a loop connection, it's important to have a couple of spare loop connections. Now, this will probably be too light for Giant Trevally, so, but what I'll do is I'll probably just pull the loop through itself and then just make a connection with the material, but just have something that you can make. Some spares. Yeah. Just some loop connections. It really, um, once again, it just a little essential that people forget about. So from your fly line to your fly, you need leader material. So I take a couple of spools. Do you? I was just tying my fly to the fly line. <laughs> You're an absolute idiot. That's why I didn't catch anything. So the leader materials that you'd need will obviously have to suit the application or the fish that you're going to catch. But for our application or the species that we targeted was mainly on a 12 and a 10 and an 8 weight. So for the 8 weight we fished 20 and 15 pound fluorocarbon. I sometimes even switched over to 25 pound. On the 10 weight we fished 25 pound up to 80 pound if we were targeting Giant Trevally with a 10 weight. And on the 12 weight was up to 120, so mm -hmm. from 80 to 120 pound. Yeah, and um, we're going to talk about it later, but a pair of good pliers with some cutters or dedicated cutters are essential to try and cut this fluorocarbon. You don't want to be stuck out there trying to tie on a new fly and you don't have something to, yes. to, to cut the leader with. Yeah, 100%. Which I find myself in that situation often. And then you've got to go find a mate that's normally a couple of hundred meters away. Yes. Trudge to him and then get him to cut your leader line to tie your fly. Yeah, that just wastes so much time and that's usually when you start spotting like the fish. That's the reason why I didn't get my big jeet on this trip. Uh, okay, you were underprepared. Because I didn't have flyers. So, the question from monofilament or fluorocarbon, that's up to you. Obviously, there's a massive price difference. I think fluorocarbon is more useful in the lighter stuff. So, from 30 pound and down, I would go fluorocarbon. It just gives you that little bit more abrasion resistance. 100 pound, 120 pound, even 150 pound monofilament is absolutely perfect. And I don't think you actually need fluorocarbon. It's also a lot stiffer. So that's up to you and it depends on your budget. So to complete your fishing rig, the rig that you're actually going to target your fish species with are the flies. Now, firstly, a good selection of flies is necessary, especially if you're gonna target multiple fish species. If you're interested in what the best saltwater flies are, we did a video on that a couple of weeks ago. Be sure to check that out. We'll also link to that down in the description down below. So the flies will obviously be stored in fly boxes. So this is a very large boat box and we'll store, you know, fill it up with all these big sempers and poppers and stuff like that. So this you obviously can't carry with you. Yeah, it's a bit big. It's big. It's gonna take up too much space in your bag when you could be putting other cool stuff. In. Exactly, and you might only use like four or five of these flies in a day, if, if you're lucky or unlucky. Yeah. So this you can store on the boat. So wherever the boat drops you or, you know, in one of the hatches on the boat, you can store it in there. And then you transfer these bigger flies into either Ziploc bags we have this great little snobby bag with ziplocs and well this is still brand new but then you just put your larger flies in there for your smaller flies what do you use there got some little fly boxes just fill them up that one's pretty empty because <laughs> we lost them all on big fish <laughs> yes <laughs> um but yeah just some small fly boxes just keep everything nice and organized you can see this is Pierre's box. I don't know if you can see in there how unorganized that is. But and it's full of rust. And, and it's full of rust. Yeah, well. This is probably straight from the Maldives still. But check out that 10 best saltwater fly video that we made. It's really cool. And Pierre runs through everything from a small little crazy Charlie all the way up to these double barrel poppers. Another point that I want to make on the flies is before you go on the trip, make sure to speak to the guides or the lodge or the outfitter that you're going to. These guides very often tie their own flies and it's not only about supporting them. If you buy flies from them right there, you know that these flies are tested on that specific environment that you're gonna be fishing with. So you know that you are getting the correct fly for, the, for those fish. So having a fly rod and a reel and a fly line and your fly, 
you can technically catch a fish but you'll probably get yourself very hurt and you won't be as successful if you just have that going on a or as enjoyable trip. or yeah. it won't be enjoyable at all so on the water you definitely need the following things that we're going to cover now we'll make it more enjoyable and it will make you a lot more successful and the first thing is everything revolves around a proper backpack now because you're spending so much time in the water you need something that is really waterproof now this is one thing that i really didn't consider and if pia didn't actually bring one along for me i would have just rocked up with my camera bag <laughs> and probably just a backpack yes but after the first hour of fishing in this hostile saltwater environment you realize that everything is going to get drenched yes uh, there's not not a matter of if but when yes it's it's 100 guaranteed so invest in as good bag as you can i firmly believe in roll top bags because there's less to go wrong with but that is your own sort of that's your own opinion or your own decision to make what this doubles as if you go on a saltwater trip or travel anywhere in the world this also doubles as your carry-on luggage so We'll cover that later on how to specifically pack your bags, but all your carry-on stuff and your expensive stuff and your heavier stuff, this goes on your back when you go onto the plane. You can't have enough waterproof bags. So inside your waterproof bag, you can put more waterproof bags. Yes, like yeah, we've got there. There we go. Just more waterproof bags, more waterproof bags. Because you never know when a rogue wave is going to come and knock you over and then you've just rolled open your roll top oh yeah and just get yeah. soaked inside so if yes. everything is in waterproof bags in waterproof bags in waterproof bags there's less chance you're going to yes. destroy and it, camera equipment yeah. and get your lunch soggy and it sort of organizes all the equipment in different compartments which is great because it just helps finding stuff a lot easier yeah a very important little thing to take with on any salt water trip is enough sunscreen We'll talk about the clothes as well later on and, and how important that is because to keep yourself shaded from, from the sun is really, really important. And when you're on the water, you don't realize it, but you're getting burnt from the water up, the reflection, yes. as well as from the top. So there's, there's nowhere to hide from the sun. So yes. you can just cover up as, as, much, as, as much as possible. And the things that you can't cover up, put sunblock on. Yes, 100%. But you need to cover up yourself as much as possible. Yeah. And that is not only for sunburn, it also, it's also a real, it's a hydration issue. So mm -hmm. you get dehydrated a lot quicker if you open. So just talking about the hydration part of things, it's very important to have mm -hmm. good water bottles or water, not necessarily good water bottles. I mean, it's not necessary to spend, you know, five hundred or two hundred dollars on a water bottle or whatever. But just make sure that you have a water bottle that's sort of sturdy and it won't be able to puncture and that it doesn't leak inside your backpack that has happened to me before yeah i really like these stainless steel ones just because it keeps the water cold for most of the day yes or you just fill up with coffee and keep it warm yes most of the day. 100%. Yeah. another very important item to take along on your saltwater trip that i see many anglers forget is a proper rain jacket now it doesn't have to be the warmest thing in the world that's not it's not there to keep you warm but if you get spray, especially when you sit in the front of a skiff or if there's a squall coming through, you will get wet and you just need something to sort of break that wind. Yeah, and I think also fishing all day in the sun and start going into sunset and evening, that temperature does drop pretty quick. Yes. And if you're slightly wet still, you can, you can get pretty cold. So yes. it's just something to just keep the wind chill off. Yes. Um, and protect you from, from any rain or squalls. Yes. And also helps if you taking a boat like we did every day to the atolls yes. boat trip back it's a lot more comfortable just sitting with a nice little jacket on yeah just keeps you dry and keeps you comfortable now here is one of the things that breaks my heart is let's talk about pliers so like chris said earlier you need pliers to cut through your leader material and also to remove flies from a fish's mouth so i had a very nice pair of hatch pliers well it was a good thing that you didn't catch any fish so you didn't really <laughs> miss them 100 <laughs> percent. so I, that's, I needed your pliers you needed my pliers <laughs> obviously you won't have them because you can't afford them but anyway <laughs> <laughs> so pliers are super essential and what's more essential 
after the fact, after I've learned this, is how you secure them to your body or to your person. So I, I secure them to this little Velcro tab on my bag. I think Chris will cut some footage in here where it's actually still attached to me. But then it just went missing because of we were fishing in such rough conditions and then we didn't have one. Didn't you lose a net as well? Off your bag? No, so I, I lost... I think the problem is not with the pliers or the way of securing them. It's, it's the angler. It could be the angler. Okay, yeah. well, that might be. It's the <laughs> common denominator. But now I want to get back to this is the pliers is have something spare. Once again, the, the theme of having spare items that can cover areas where if you lose something, like if you lose your sunnies, have spare sunnies or have a spare cap or anything like that. And we luckily had a spare pair of forceps and that helped us to remove flies even to, you can hear it's a little bit rusted from all the salt water, but it's very important to have a spare one as well. So pliers and spare pliers are super essential. It's super important to protect yourself from the sun as we just discussed and one way to help protect your hands from especially sunburn and from little cuts from the line is having nice fishing gloves. This is a great pair from Snowbee. Mm. You can you can use any sort of gardening glove or whatever, but these work really, really well. Yeah, this was one of the things that just never crossed my mind about taking on, on a trip is, is sun gloves. And if Pierre didn't bring me a pair, then um, I would have been very uncomfortable for seven days fishing in the salt. Because yeah. after a few hours of being soaked, your hands become brittle and wrinkled and soft. And any little line burn is just, it just cuts straight through the skin. So having these sun gloves on, not only protects you from the sun, but protects you from the line yeah. while you're fly fishing. It really, it, it really took care of your little beautiful hands. It did. Look at them. <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> and speaking of gloves, it's also important if you don't fish with gloves, or if you have gloves that don't have very long fingers, if you are going to handle fish that have very aggressive scoots on the back like these, or just in front of their tail fins like these giant trevally, mm. to have some sort of tailing Tailing glove. Now, this is literally just a gardening glove that I yeah. bought for you. If you translate it to dollars, it'd probably be like a dollar. Um, and it's so, it just makes it so much more comfortable. And, it, and I mean, if you grab those GTs by their tails, their scoots are super sharp. So if that fish mm. kicks. And he will kick. He will yeah, kick. I said they are. They are so strong. And then you just yeah. ruin your hands. And that actually, it's not just about ruining your hands. And I mean, Chris is a pretty boy or whatever, but I mean, <laughs> it's not only that, it's about actually getting infected later on and, and then becoming a real issue. So just remember to wear your tailing gloves and not like me forget about yeah. them. Yeah, they can, 100%. They can cut your hands to pieces. This is another thing that I didn't consider going yes. on this trip was how to deal with landing decent sized fish. Yes. An essential item when not only going on saltwater fly fishing trips, but sort of any outdoor adventure is to pack a medical kit. Yes. Because you never know what is going to happen on these trips. Um, it could be nothing. Like for us, nothing really happened. So we didn't really need a medical kit, but we did use things out of it to make our lives a lot easier. Like yeah. the medical strapping tape. We ended up strapping mm -hmm. all our hands because by day six or seven, they are just, even though we're wearing gloves, the line burn from casting and from stripping stripping and hook sets into the GTs just destroys your gloves and your hands. So if you don't want to take a medical aid kit, the least you need to do is find out from the operator that you are going with and make sure that the skiff which you are going to fish from or the the guy that's going to be with you or anything like that, that that person is going to have a medical aid or a medical kit with him or a first aid kit, that's the correct word. And in this kit, I would definitely, as a minimum, have a tape that you can sort of use as a little bandage or whatever, but tape, tape things up, a sanitizer, an ointment, and then a big one that I almost forgot is a is a plug, some sort of thing to stop diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> that, those are the, and painkillers obviously, which is yeah. um, something, especially if you spend a lot of hours in the bar. 
So let's talk about the clothes that you need to wear because you can't really go there naked with just a rod and a backpack on your back. You're gonna get pretty burnt. Now. You're gonna get burnt and um, you know, it's, some things are gonna get a lot of light where there's not usually a lot of light. So let's talk and about... G and GTs, although they're, they're not known for eating worms, <laughs> You could leap out the water and you never you never know so rather cover up and be safe so let's let's start from the top so let's talk from the head to 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 your feet right hat hat very important so i use this cap which is a cap from the mission i like using caps but many people prefer using wide brimmed hats um, i don't know what your thoughts are on caps well, what I did notice is that everyone seemed to decorate their caps with flies, even though they weren't using any of the flies. Is that more of a, of a fashion statement or is that a, a no, functional? No, it's functional. It's, you don't want to, your flies are in your backpack. So you don't want to breach around your backpack the whole time and get a fly change. Tra this is like my, my fly box, like there. Now fish, oh, let me put on a turn F crab. Oh, no problem. Um, here's one here. Yeah. It doesn't want to come out because I didn't debarb it, but I could take it out. Here, <laughs> I've got a deep turn F crab. Oh, oh, you want a little Alflexo crab? I've got one here. Yeah. Anyway, you get the drift. <laughs> anyway, so yeah. super important and take a spare because when you when you ride in the skiff and this thing blows off. Yeah, someone's hat's gonna go. Someone's hat is gonna go. By the way, just pull your buff over it. Just makes it easier. Little tip. But anyway. If you lose it, you're gonna get screwed. So yeah, just take a nap, just take a spare. From there, we're going down. What is it there? Sunglasses. Sunnies. What is? You, what are your thoughts on sunnies? <laughs> because how many pairs did you lose? Yeah. So don't skimp on sunnies. <laughs> Buy a good pair of polarized sunglasses. Uh, you want polarized to protect your eyes from the glare of the water and also to spot fish swimming on the back and in the waves and, and to sight fish to fish. So. A good pair of sunnies, a good pair of polarized sunnies, and a high quality pair because I bought a cheap pair of polarized sunnies and they lasted one day and all the film just started coming off. Um, yes. So I had to discard those after one day. I didn't bring a spare, so I had to borrow a friend's spare, which I proceeded to lose the following day. I don't know where, I think uh, I took it off and put it on my head. So. Another thing to note with sunnies is to maybe buy a lanyard. Yes, yeah, or a retainer <laughs> um, or something. So I ended up borrowing another pair from another friend, which I ended up using for the rest of the trip. Yeah. So just make sure that you take spares. So the spare can probably be something not too good. These, I just don't want to punt specific brands on this video because that's what, not what it's about. But these are costas. And if you buy, in my opinion, if you buy a single pair of sunnies and you're going to spend a lot of money on them make sure that they have glass lenses now they are slightly heavier but they don't scratch as easy which is a major thing yeah i've gone through quite a few pairs of sunglasses in my life and glass sunglasses unless you're going to lose them yeah last. or sit on them or something like that yeah so they do last so think about that and it's really an investment because we can't see the fish or if you lose your sunglasses because they break or something like that, it's it's just a recipe for disaster. You can't go on a sort of fly fishing trip, sight fishing fish if you don't have polarized glasses. So. It's yeah, it, and you won't look the part as well. But you need yeah, you need you need. It's you, just you need it. You need to look cool for the photos and the video too. So hundred percent. Look for a cool pair like Piers. This is cool. Makes them look cool on the videos. Makes him look a lot better looking than he really is in Yeah, it life. covers up most of your face. It's not necessarily <laughs> there to sort of protect your face. It just covers up ugly people. <laughs> That's why we couldn't get a big enough pair for Chris. <laughs> so, ticked the neck. So, a buff is such a cool little invention. It's so stupid because it's just material in a tube, but you can protect your neck it can help to keep your cap in place. You pull it over your cap, it keeps it in place so it doesn't, the wind doesn't take it. It keeps your sunnies in place, it protects your whole head, it keeps clear away from the side of your peripheral vision. It's just 
and no matter how much sunblock you put on your face, it's eventually going to get washed off. So having a buff cover your whole face, which I made the mistake the first day, I dropped my buff down under my chin. <laughs> Fished like that the whole day. <laughs> At the end of the day, my lips were sunburnt I and remember blistering. That. My nose was like Rudolph the Red Nose Rainier. <laughs> so wearing a buff around your face to cover up while you're fishing on these saltwater trips, I think is a must. 100%. So here we have a hooded shirt. There are so many different brands and styles. The biggest thing is make sure that you wear a long sleeve shirt. Now, if you're just fishing for a half an hour outside, it's fine, short sleeves work. But if you're going to spend a couple of days, full days in the sun, make sure you wear something with long sleeves and at least some sort of UV protection. Mm -hmm. And something that dries quickly as well, because you are 100%. going to get soaked. Yes. Pretty much most of the time. So something that um, can get wet, cool you down, but when you get out of the water again, dry out nice and quickly so you're not stuck in wet clothes all day. Yes. So I take two shirts on a trip. If you really don't have enough or a lot of space to pack stuff, take at least two. So when you're fishing with this pair, just rinse the other one. This one is rinsed out the night before and it's drying and the next day you swap them around then this one is drying so that you can at least keep it going. Rinse them just to sort of make yourself presentable and sort of that you don't scare people off. That's your smell. Yes. <laughs> pants. You should wear pants. Everybody on a saltwater fishing trip. So pants. the first layer of pants will obviously be your undies that or you can go all natural or whatever you want to do but tights I want to speak about tights listen this is not a place to be shy or scared that you might look like you're in a ballet or anything like that wear these yeah I used to mock Pierre a lot about his tights wear until these. I went on a saltwater fly fishing trip yes and tights to hide yourself from the sun are essential so I choose to wear long tights because, as Chris just said, it protects the lower section of your leg and it as well. It accentuates your calves yes, beautifully. Something. Yeah, thank oh. you. Thanks. And um, the biggest reason for these that you wear them under your normal pair of trousers or pants that you're going to wear is chafing. Mm -hmm. If you walk on flats and you have salt water washing up against you, even a little bit of sand, it's a recipe for a rash. And like you said before, bring two pairs because. One day you can wear the one, the other one you can rinse the night before, and then the next day it'll be dry. Yes. Clean-ish to wear. <laughs> yeah. And over that, I just wear a normal pair of trousers. You don't need a long pair of trousers. It's just really to make yourself look better on video, because you don't want to be wearing only tights. Yeah, exactly. Ex exactly. And that kind of shows your... Weak spots. Weak, your weak spots. <laughs> <laughs> it should show your strong spots, but not all of us are blessed like that. If you do have a pair of pliers that you're going to carry with you, make sure to not attach it to your bag or anything like that. That's a mistake that I made. Get a wading belt and just put it through your pair of trousers and attach whatever accessory you want to attach to yourself, like your pliers, attach that to there. I never got a wading belt on this trip, but next next trip I'm sure... You'll upgrade to wading belt one. level. No. Okay, that's wading belt. <laughs> Let's go. So Chris, do you think you can do a saltwater fishing trip barefoot? I think you could, but it would be very unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> no, the coral and rocks and reef is next level sharp. Yeah. It's, uh, I actually left my shoes there at the end of the trip because <laughs> they were just finished. They I left just, a pair there as well. <laughs> they were just destroyed. If you've never been on a saltwater trip, you don't understand how sharp this coral is. It'll just rip yes. your skin and your feet and your body to pieces. So, good quality wading boots or yes. shoes. Um, I actually went on the trip with uh, trail running shoes, which wasn't optimal, but it's what I had at the time. That's fine. Yeah. So it lasted. Yeah. It lasted. So these are it only, old... It only lasted seven days, but it, it just yeah, but it, lasted. So if you are only going to... This is a very important point to make. If you are only going to do a week trip, and you know for the next five years you're not... Or three years you're not going to do another trip, it's fine going with a pair of trail shoes like that. I would actually say it's 100% fine. If you want to ask 
a person in a fly shop that wants to sell you the best shoes, they're probably going to say something else, but I, I would really say it's fine. But so are you trying to tell me I'm not going on another trip in the next no, five years? No, probably not. We've run out of money. <laughs> anyway, but if you are going to go on trips regularly, do get a good pair of flat sneakers. They call it flat sneakers. Patagonia makes them. Sims makes some great ones. Orvis makes them. There's a lot of brands. I'm not going to go into which brand is better, which is not a review. However, these shoes still don't last forever. I remember I did a trip to Sudan. A 10 days trip, went through a pair of these. Gone, yeah. shot. So, but it's important to protect your feet. Inside of them, you can wear a pair of neoprene waders with, you get them with integrated gravel guards. You get a loose gravel guard. I don't really mind. I sometimes even wear a normal pair of woolen socks. I just pull the, under part of the your tights just pull that over there to protect or prevent gravel from coming yeah in. you don't want if you're fishing sand flats you don't want your socks to be full of sand because it's yes. very uncomfortable chafe yes. your feet chafe your toes yes um i also used a pair of beauties on mine and perfect perfect yeah. great so that's all of your clothing that you should wear to protect yourself mainly it's it's a functional it's really functional it's not about looking good mm. Um, it's functional to protect Although you from we did, the sun. we did pull it off pretty well, I reckon. You think so? Uh, I think it looked good. Is it? Yeah. Oh, well. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> so, so that's all of the equipment that you need to carry with you on the water. So let's now jump into what you could take with on a saltwater fly fishing trip. That's sort of additional off the water stuff. Before packing off the water stuff, I would really phone once again the outfitter or the lodge to find out if there are any travel or luggage restrictions on the amount that you can take with especially if you're taking a charter flight yeah because you can catch your big international flight there and you're allowed 30 kilos or whatever yeah. and then you rock up to your smaller flight and now you've got to lose half your kit because yeah and what are you going to allow on the plane yeah so your fishing stuff is obviously the most essential because that's why you went and then you're gonna i mean you can't take your case of wine or case of brandy or rum or whatever i mean that those are the kind of things that you really need to consider and find out before the time before going on the trip yeah i think this category of um everything that you take besides your fishing gear is very subjective it's whatever makes you comfortable and whatever you're gonna need on the trip whether it be meds whether it be Rehydrate <laughs> when yes. you be a speaker. <laughs> yes. So let's talk about what we took. So the first thing is obviously clothes. So once you get back to camp after the day's fishing, it's always great to have a shower and to just freshen up. So it's good to have at least two pairs of fresh clothes. So take two t-shirts, maybe something warmer. I don't Warm. know. Yeah. If you, if you if you fish in places that get slightly cooler. A pair of trousers and maybe a pair of flip-flops or you know any comfortable shoe to wear around camp yeah then obviously your toiletries don't don't skimp on toothbrushes and toothpaste yes and shower gel or yeah all the, soap all the basics yeah. all your basics and then um, obviously for me it's very important to have great music so i always take my little jbl speaker with me yeah waking up in the morning to peers music was was a memory that will probably stick with me forever. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it really got the, the vibe going for the yes. day, got everybody up and going. So that's what it's all about, isn't yeah, that's it? That's what it's all about, yeah. Another very essential thing is power adapters and chargers. So wherever you're going, just find out what sort of power configuration they use or what their standard is. Are they using 110 volt, 220, 50 hertz, 60 hertz? I don't think there's anything else. Or if it's just a solar powered little island or something like that, mm -hmm. make sure that you have an adapter that can adapt your charges for your cameras and for your phones and whatever to that power source. That's one thing that we didn't mention was cameras in that, because if you catch a fish, does it even count if you didn't take a selfie with it? <laughs> for me and Pierre going on this trip, we obviously went to, to capture a lot of content so uh, cameras and filming equipment was very important for us but i would suggest bringing even at least a small little gopro with you yeah. a, a waterproof gopro because you can just whip it out take it then whip it out <laughs> take a picture of your fish 
and you don't have to worry about it getting getting wet and damaged whereas uh, some guys that I saw on our trip were trying to fiddle in their bags getting out phones while they were waist deep in water drop your phone that's over so game over <laughs> now all of this gear needs to get to your destination somehow so it needs to be packed in either your checked in luggage or your carry-on luggage so as we spoke about earlier this bag will be so whatever backpack you use make sure that it's big enough and sturdy enough to be used as your check-in or your carry-on luggage rather so this will be all of your heavier stuff and maybe very essential or expensive equipment just make sure that you don't accidentally put in pliers even these days I mean obviously flies you can't mm. can't take on the on the you know carry on but even fly lines I've had issues carrying them on on the plane with me before so make sure that you rather put your fly reels in your checked in luggage so this is your hand luggage so another thing to remember if you are bringing with cameras and batteries and drones and drone batteries etc you must take those batteries out and put it in your your carry-on luggage yes. because if that goes in the hole they're going to stop that bag yes. somewhere along the line and dispose of your batteries yo cut your bag open or yeah. stop your flight because chris forgot his drone battery in his <laughs> it <laughs> in never his happened bag. by the way <laughs> it will happen it will happen day. eventually yeah and for your check-in luggage make sure that the bag is big enough chris can you pass that bag <laughs> So this is a North Face, this is, that, that fell. So this is like a North Face duffel bag. It's, it was waterproof at a stage, but it's not anymore. The main reason why I use it is that it holds everything. I think you can literally like take a dog with you on a trip or something like bag, that. Yeah, yeah it's, it's long enough for rod tubes. So even a, like a Euronymphing rod can actually fit in there. So that's super essential and it really can take a lot of luggage. And then finally, to put all the rods in, if you don't want to take all these separate rod tubes, like this, if you don't want to take all these separate rod tubes, I mean, you're not, you don't really need them, all of them. It, it, it's wasted space and weight. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I just made a rod tube from a some, drain pipe, pipe yeah. <laughs> so yeah it works so it just opens up and you put all the rods in there and it's it's one tube and you know all your rods are in there and also you can stick a lot of stickers on it to yeah, make then, yourself yeah. look more professional yeah look cool i've been places and is it really a salt water fly fishing trip if you don't have lots of stickers on it no not really no. not really i hope that you found this video helpful and that it will help you to pack for your next salt water trip if you'd like to see more videos like this, please subscribe to our channel and turn on the notifications. Then we can let you know as soon as we release them. Until next time. Cheers. Cheers.